So hey everybody, I'm, I'm Maxime. I'm a developer advocate uh, based in Paris and I work for uh, MongoDB. Uh, so I want to show you how I built uh, back in January last year, so at the very beginning of COVID, uh, a GraphQL uh, and REST API uh, using John Hopkins uh, University dataset. Um, so everybody knows that in 2019, right, the world was uh, a very good place to live in right and then you know 2021 uh happened so well 2020 and 2021 so yeah we all know where we are now so uh at the very beginning of that pandemic uh, my goal was to make the data available uh to everybody right so make a cool chart uh, like those for example and of course make all the data available through apis so everybody could benefit from those uh, run analytics, maybe even help governments, you know, try to take decisions, these kind of things, right? And I started this project back in January, so when it was really the beginning of the pandemic actually uh, back in China. So that was my goal, right? So I needed something uh, quick and easy and I needed a data source. Uh, so of course I was inspired by John Hopkins University. Uh, I think we have all seen this uh, cool dashboard that they provided us uh, uh, also at the very beginning of the pandemic. And luckily for me, they provided soon enough a GitHub repository, which you can see here with a small arrow. Um, and uh, it looks like this, right? So you have a GitHub repository and it contains a lot of CSV files, right? So uh, as you can see, there are a few folders, especially the data one. And uh, to produce all those data sets, all the data, basically they aggregated uh, many data sources from many uh, well, different sources, right? So from different countries, different governments, different entities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So just to give you an idea, that's how many sources they used, right? So definitely I didn't want it to do my own parsing and my own data gathering. So they did a really good job here. So I had no intention at all to try to beat the, the data set they did. So I reused uh, humbly what they'd done and I tried to produce my own thing, but based on that, right? So the data is as good as uh, what they provided um, uh, the word with, right, basically. So in those folders, they produce these uh, daily reports like uh, like those, right? So it looks, looks nice, right? You have one CSV file for each day. So it looked like a very good idea, you know, to just use them and just, you know, populate the, the API and the data, the data set with those files. If you look a bit closely, uh, like if we zoom in one of those files, for example, the very first one that was published actually, uh, which was uh, January 20, 22nd of 2020, uh, you see you have that file, right? So it looks nice. You have province slash, slash state, uh, country slash region, um, some dates and some, some, some values, of course, of confirmed deaths and recovered cases. You see some data is missing, but it's probably zeros. You see the, the date has a certain format, etc., etc. Uh, soon enough, uh, if you check another file, you see it's actually completely different. So you have like uh, like new columns. Uh, you have uh, it's not province slash state anymore. It's province underscore state. So that's annoying because it would make a different field uh, in MongoDB. Um, then you have a different format for the date. You have latitude and longitude now, and with longitude with a weird underscore at the end of the column name. Uh, you have zeros now, so the data is not missing anymore. It's actually zeros. Uh, so it, 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 it's a mess, right? It's a big, big mess. So not consistent, not very predictable. Looks like the format of the files can change basically daily. Uh, I, I can't really rely on that. That's really, really not good. So when you're planning on designing and working on an API like this, uh, basically you want to reduce as much as possible the number of WTF per minute, right? So you need to make sure that it's consistent, it's uh, always the same thing, it's predictable, so your users uh, know what they can uh, expect from your API. So I was looking for another solution and uh, there is another folder next to this one, which is a time series folder. And in this one, it's much more simpler, much more smaller uh, in a way. Uh, you have only five files, uh, five CSV files built as a time series. So as you can see, you have like three files for what they call the global, um, uh, the global files. So that's where you have all the countries eventually divided in sub, uh, 
sub sub regions, uh, sub uh, states for some of them or province. And then you have the US uh, where they don't gather uh, recovered uh, cases, but you have two big files for just the US because they are subdivided into states and counties. So it's a lot more subdivided. So based on this, if you look at if we look at one of those files, uh, of course, it's divided by uh, type of cases. So this is global uh, confirmed, for example. So you have only confirmed cases, for example, in this file. Uh, but I have something much more clean, right? I have a province, state, country, latitude and longitude for each uh, uh, pinpoint. So that would be very helpful to build uh, some kind of maps and, and, uh, yeah, and charts like this. And as you can see, I have one colon uh, for each day, right? So each day, they basically do a new commit in that repository and add an extra colon all the way to the right, you know, to add that new extra day. Uh, so it looks good enough, looks very good. But uh, if I import this directly in MongoDB, I can use a Mongo import tool, for example, uh, which handles CSV files quite nicely. I would end up with this kind of schema design, right? Which is a terrible schema design. You can't really work with this, right? Uh, so uh, it, it's pretty terrible to have the date like this as a field and not as an actual value. Uh, so, and also like, I, I would like to have something like that instead, right? A date and with an actual is a date, right? Not just some kind of string that uh, would be much more helpful. Also, if you look at the the latitude and longitude, it would be much easier to have a GeoJSON document like this. It's, it's much easier and supported in MongoDB to work like this. Uh, so I needed to transform this and make it much better and nicer, right? What I wanted in the first place was to have really one document uh, with one date, one place, and the numbers for this particular day. So let's say France, uh, I want a uh, confirm death recovered cases for uh, the 22nd of January 2020, for example. That's what I wanted. So with all that, uh, there is also one table that is actually useful. It's a lookup table they provided. So all those um, documents and lines can be associated with one of those lines here. So I can recover some extra stuff like the UID, uh, ISO codes for the countries, population, etc., etc. And with all that and some Python magic, uh, I came up with this, right? So I just uh, parsed all those documents, all that CSV data, and produced something that looked like this, which is much more easy to work with and much more convenient. So the, the schema design, I can't repeat this enough. It's very important uh, in MongoDB and in, in databases in general. So and here you can see that I have information about the place. So here it's uh, France, right? And I have some one date and have some numbers, right? So exactly what I wanted. And with this, I can really do easily some charts and stuff like that. The one I presented actually at the very beginning of that presentation. Um, so I came up in the end with a few different database uh, collections. So as you can see, I produce like some summary for each countries, uh, produce uh, the global collection, which is based on the global files only, uh, the US only, which is based on the two files from the US. And then I regrouped global and US only into global and US, which uh, uh, allow me to do a much more uh, precise map, right? With all the, pin, the, the small points for the US. Uh, in the global collection, the US is just one big country. So one big point for each day, uh, which is not very precise if you want to do a, a map. So with this, uh, I can now, um, I, I have no data in MongoDB. It's actually available uh, for free if you, uh, I will share at the end the links, but you can actually access this, this uh, database for free and play with it and build some cool products. And with this, I wanted to build then a REST API and a GraphQL API on top of this. So let's, uh, let's do that. Let's hack. So um, let's see. So first, I go to MongoDB Atlas, right? That's where uh, my project lives, right? So I have here in my project three uh, clusters. I have a pre-prod cluster and the actual production cluster, the one that is actually available uh, to everybody. And uh, the data is in here, right? So I actually connected here with MongoDB Compass. So you can see basically the same, uh, the same thing and refresh. And you see those collections and those, uh, those documents. So for example, if I look in the global collection, that's the type of documents I just presented in my, in my slide deck, right? Um, so, um, 
let's see. So first thing, build the REST API. So for that, I go to Realm, which is a serverless uh, platform that's built on top of MongoDB Atlas, and I can build the REST API in here. So the first thing I'm going to do here is create a new application, right? So this is a production one, the one people are actually using right now in production. They sent uh, uh, 215 uh, requests already in the last hour. So you see it's, it's pretty pretty popular. I would say it's, it's working. Um, so let's create a new API, uh, a new a new application, sorry. And I'm going to call it uh, like API Days uh, Helsinki, for example. Uh, I'm going to use the production cluster and I'm going to deploy this uh, in Ireland because the cluster is living in Ireland right now. So I'm going to deploy that app. It takes a few seconds like this. And uh, now I can build all my backend system basically in here. So uh, for example, uh, here I can manage the rules, the schemas. I will have to create a schema actually. I can manage my users, uh, the authentication of those users. Uh, I can use GraphQL, which I'm going to present in a second. I can create functions and triggers and also third party services, which is one, what I'm going to use right now uh, to build the REST API. So I go in here in a third uh, party services and I add a service. So I could integrate with AWS or Twilio or GitHub or other things. But what I want to do here is HTTP, right? I want to do a, a REST API. So I'm going to call it um, REST API, which is very uh, <laughs> very, very easy to, to imagine. And uh, I'm going to create a webhook. So this webhook will be uh, the webhook for the global collection. Uh, and uh, it's going to be so running a system. I can log with uh, function arguments if I send any. So why not? And that's basically all I need. Uh, I also need to change the HTTP method because here it's going to be read only. Um, uh, API, so it's just a get basically, and I'm going to respond with result. That's also, also very important, of course, because uh, it needs to expect some result uh, in the body. And that's it. If I would, if I wanted to secure this uh, API, I could do it uh, with this, with the request validation. Uh, but of course, I don't really care about this right now. So I'm just going to save this. And no, so the settings are just here, what I just did. And you have now a function editor where you can actually um, uh, set the code that's going to be executed every time you call this function, you call this uh, webhook, right? So I'm going to do something very, very easy. I'm just going to copy paste this line right here. You can delete all that stuff, actually. Just keep the function. I'm just going to return this. So it's context service.get here. I retrieve the access to my uh, Atlas cluster. I don't even need like a login password because everything is already integrated. Here, I'm going to say it was in the COVID-19 uh, database and it's a global collection. And I'm just going to run a find one just to prove that I can actually return just the first document that MongoDB is able to find. I hope it's big enough, of course. Yeah, it looks, looks big enough, look too big actually, like that. Uh, I can save. And now all I need to do is review and deploy. So here's all the stuff I did. And I click deploy. Now if I get back, it's deployed. Uh, now I go back to settings here and I have a curl command that I can conveniently use. Here is the webhook URL, right? It is the same one here. So I can just copy paste this and I just copy paste this in a sh new shell. And as you can see here, I have my answer. Uh, let's make this a little bit cleaner. Uh, like this. Um, and as you can see, I have my document, right? So it's already working. It's uh, very easy to do. As you can see, it takes very like a few minutes. And I am, I'm already returning my documents. Um, let's uh, actually do something a bit more complex, like a real REST API, the one that I actually published in production. So for this, uh, I'm just going to use my real code, which is a bit more complex than this, but it's really the same thing, it's the same principle. Let me just show you how it looks like. So pretty simple. As you can see, I'm retrieving here from the payload uh, the different uh, fields that I need, like the country, the state, and etc. Uh, and I'm going to build a query, a projection, and a sort, uh, which is actually hard coded based on the date. And with this, 
I build my my query and I just send this query at the end with a find. I just pass the query, the project, the sort, transform this in an array, and then I just set everything like this in the body and just works. So if I save this again and redeploy, I can now do actually the same thing, but this time I can just add, hope it's big enough, here at the bottom I can just add uh, like country uh, equal France for example, and as you can see I have now all the documents for France, right? So it's really as simple as that. Okay, so now we have a REST API, done. Let's move on to uh, how to do GraphQL API. So for this, um, I'm gonna go to the GraphQL um, uh, tab here. And the first thing I need is a JSON schema, right? Because uh, GraphQL uh, uses schemas, right? So click on generate JSON schema, it's actually gonna lead me to the rules here in the data access. And as you can see, I have all my collections available. I'm gonna click on global. And I need to choose a permission template. So here it's a read-only database, right? I want to make my data available to everybody. So I'm just gonna say users can read uh, read-only all the data, right? Uh, I'm gonna say configure. In here, uh, so I don't really have rules, but I have a schema. So I'm gonna click on schema and I'm gonna generate a schema. And here, as you can see, it's gonna sample a thousand documents and generate a schema for me based on uh, what documents, you know, it's just, uh, it's a scanning uh, in my MongoDB collection. It takes a few seconds to just query those documents and, you know, do the analytics to generate the schema. Should be done in a few seconds like this. And it generates something that looks like uh, my schema, right? Where I have uh, confirmed, confirmed daily, country, et cetera, et cetera, the dates, et cetera, et cetera. And I can see that it's missing here, uh, it missed a state uh, field, right? So I can actually fix my schema if I want to like this. And I can change, uh, well, uh, add state, right? It's also a string, so I can just uh, add state because I don't see it anywhere. And that's it. I'm just gonna say save. And I'm gonna go to GraphQL. And now, as you can see, uh, endpoint has been generated, so that's my GraphQL endpoint that I can use. And here I have a GraphQL. I hope it's not too big, too large. Like this looks nice. Um, and as you can see, I have already access to my global uh, uh, global uh, endpoint, and I can just query uh, documents like this. So Afghanistan does not have a state, uh, but if I change this query, for example, I think it's query like this, uh, country France. If I do this, I have one of the documents from France, for example. So that's great. That's, uh, that's already working, right? And if I deploy this, actually I forgot something. Um, I need to make the authentication available because this endpoint is of course secured with authentication, right? You must be authenticated to access this. So I need to go to authentication and I could authenticate with Google or Facebook APIs or whatever, but I'm just gonna make this anonymous, right? So I'm just gonna click here, say save, deploy again, my modification. And, uh, and yes, so I just need then to retrieve this uh, copy app ID. So that's the application ID of my project that I just created. And I get coming here, and here I've prepared already my uh, queries. So what I need is first retrieve a token. So I just copy paste here my application ID, and I can use this anonymous user authentication to generate a token. So here, as you can see, I retrieve an access token and a refresh token, but I'm just gonna use the access token. And in here at the bottom, I hope you can read, I hope it's big enough. Um, I have prepared a query uh, for my GraphQL endpoint where uh, I'm just gonna query for a French document where the state does not exist, so that's the mainland. For all the documents in March, uh, oh, I forgot to change this, so March in here. And just query for the dates and the confirmed daily cases, right? So here I copy paste a token. 
here. Oop. I need to copy paste my app ID right here. And, and like this, I have, as you can see, all the documents for March sorted in order with all the new number of cases for each day in March in France, right? So, yes, that's it. So I think I'm done and I'm also at time. So that's it for me. Thank you very much.